a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the gospel of the Lord. Beloved, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the one whose mercies are new every morning. Amen. This is the long season of the church year known as ordinary time. It doesn't mean that it's boring time or that it's not extraordinary in some ways, but it does mean that we go from roughly Pentecost Sunday all the way to Advent without big seasonal changes or festival days, although as we get closer, Reformation and All Saints will give us clues that ordinary time is coming to an end. I don't know about you all, but I would like some ordinary time out in the world. (laughs) A time when like nothing out of the ordinary, nothing unimaginable happens. A time when we don't wake up to news of the stripping of basic rights from people of color or our LGBTQIA 2S plus siblings or women. A time when mass shootings don't outnumber the days of the year. A time when voting districts fairly and accurately represent the people who live there. A time when we offer a hand to those people who are drowning in student loan debt, which, by the way, includes many brand new pastors. A time when those tasked with governing do so by respecting the dignity of every person. So it makes me wonder about what prompted Jesus to ask this question in the gospel reading today. To what will I compare this generation, he says. You see, Jesus and his followers had just completed a mission, sort of a preaching and teaching tour to several cities in Galilee. Those cities were being occupied by Rome. But all in all, Even the people who lived there were getting along pretty well. Their local economies were robust. Their religious institutions were were thriving. Frankly, they didn't need to welcome Jesus or his ragtag group of followers and their message for care for the poor, welcome all people, turn the other cheek. The people in Galilee were quite satisfied with how life was going, in spite of the fact that they were literally being held hostage by their enemies. Now, Jesus notes in our reading today that before he arrived, the people had rejected John the Baptist because he didn't eat or drink. So they said, he must have a demon. And then when Jesus gets there and he does eat and drink, they say, well, you're just a drunkard and a glutton. Clearly, the people had no desire to hear or consider anything other than the messaging that was promoted by the systems of oppression. They were certainly not interested in hearing a new word from God. And this frustrated Jesus and prompted him to ask the question, to what will I compare this generation? 
So if Jesus and John understood that God speaks a new word into our old ways of being, even when our old ways of being are very comfortable, if this was the point of their teaching, bringing a new commandment, I wonder, what would this say about us today in 21st century Western United States of America? If Jesus were to compare this current generation, this current generation to something else, it's possible that we wouldn't look that much different from the generation he encountered face to face. In Jesus' time, people did not always agree within their religious communities. Even among those who believed the same ways, there were differences and arguments, and those are well documented in scripture. In fact, that's why we have so many letters from Paul to so many believing communities, including the believers in Rome that we heard from today. By the way, Don, well done with that letter, because Paul, not always the clearest writer. <laughs> Could Jesus compare the church today to the believers in Galilee or Rome? I mean, widely speaking, it's clear that not all Christians believe the same way. The Lutheran tradition I was raised in would not have allowed me to be a pastor. Uh, neither do the Southern Baptists or the Roman Catholics, but we would all agree that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, right? So we have some things we would agree upon and, and other things we clearly would not. It is even true that in the ELCA, we disagree about things, important things. And sometimes we do not find common ground. And I think this is a gift and a curse in the ELCA that we are able to say, we don't agree on this right now, and so we're gonna put it aside for a minute, or three years. <laughs> and dear people of Agnus Day, I don't know you well enough to know how you manage conflict. But if you are like any of the other congregations I have worked with, I imagine you have had your share. Now the same is true of the wider culture. Think for a minute, do we know of a country where the people are divided and disagree vehemently on matters of national importance? Does anybody come to mind? <laughs> Understanding this kind of division and dissension and close-mindedness helps us understand what Jesus encountered in first century Palestine. And into such a time as that, and into such a time as this, we might expect Jesus to speak words of rebuke, to offer a stern and specific corrective. And instead, into that and into this, Jesus offers an invitation to rest. For people who are striving and straining under empire, this would have been an unexpected and puzzling invitation. It would have seemed counterintuitive, almost, almost like a king who rides into the midst of a kingdom on a donkey, or a religious leader who befriends tax collectors and sinners. Jesus offers to those who had rejected him and his teaching and John's before him, and us, a place to lay down their burdens. They might have been burdens that they didn't even know they were carrying anymore because they had been carrying them for so long. Jesus offers rest. So I'm gonna to look to the musicians this morning and for confirmation about this. And if I'm wrong, keep it to yourselves and we'll talk later. Um, in a musical piece, a rest is as important as the notes, right? It's, it's, it's a rest that pauses and it 
allows us to, to hear um, what isn't blank space, but what is, what is really um, interacting with the harmony and the melody in very important ways. If you've ever sung in a rest at the wrong place, you know this is true. <laughs> We also need those seasons and times and places of rest. After Jesus invites them to rest in our gospel reading today, he moves on and he offers his yoke instead of the yokes that they and we had been wearing. Now, maybe you've heard this explanation in other sermons, but it's, it's worth noting that the wearing of a single yoke will quickly tire out the one wearing it. They will collapse at the end of the day. But when a double yoke is worn, for instance, by oxen in the field, the work is shared and if a young animal needs to learn how to do the work, sharing a yoke with an experienced animal is the perfect way to do that. At the end of the day, neither animal in a shared yoke is overtaxed. And it is reported that those animals that share a yoke will often also share their food. And then they will lie down together, side by side just like they were in the yoke. We are not often offered a season of rest. And so we become people for whom striving is our default setting. And it's understandable. There is much to do for and with God's people and God's good creation. And Jesus doesn't say, lay down your burdens and rest forever. Instead, Jesus says, rest. And then, rather than picking up that single yoke that keeps us so isolated from him and from each other, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Learn from the way I do it. Watch me go off to pray. Watch me go off to rest, out in the boat, up on the mountain. Watch me care for those who have been cast out. Watch me grill some fish for breakfast on the beach and invite my friends. Holy work, holy rest, and holy work again. It is in this rhythm of walking and following Jesus that Resting from our heavy burdens becomes how we shine forth the kingdom of God. And when we put on the shared yoke with Jesus, we join him in this work of life and liberation. We join Jesus in speaking out against empire and working for justice, freedom, and peace. We join Jesus in the work of setting captives free. We yoke ourselves not to any earthly ruler who promises to make us or anything great, but we yoke ourselves to the one who rode in on a donkey, humble and commanding peace to the nations. And when the burdens become too much for a moment or for a day or even for a season, we lay them down for a time, and we rest for a while. Dear people of God, whether you are feeling the weight of a personal burden, or a shared community burden, or a national or cultural burden, if you are comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes and bring that burden into your mind's eye and hold it there. And while you do that, Hear these words from Jesus to you. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When I end sermons, I like uh, to end them in a particular way, and since I'm gonna be with you for a season, we're gonna learn that together, it's very easy. Um, you have one word, uh, which is amen. Amen means so be it, it is your acclamation, it is participation in the word proclaimed. So I will say thanks be to God and let the church say, Amen.